And hand over to Joshua. Thank you, James. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me here. Just a disclaimer, I'm not a big fan of making presentation slides, but yeah, for you, I did something and I hope it makes sense just to guide my thoughts. Um, so I'll be sharing my screen and let me know if you can see it. Yeah, all good. Okay, great. So today we'll be talking through backlogs and again, being a product manager, at the Parasite and Microbes um, program, I would leverage Scrum and Agile principles or best practices to drive this point home. Also, I am going to be speaking from the perspective of a software development. Um, and I'll try to make sure it's a little bit more encompassing beyond software, but I mean, you'd agree that that's, that's my forte. <laughs> uh, yeah. so. Why I'm here today is to, it's more like a self discovery journey, right? I wouldn't be teaching you as much as uh, you would assume. I would more or less be trying to draw out some of those cues you already know about Agile and, and Scrum and how that affects effective backlog management. Um, so I'll be asking a few questions or just pointing out a few things you already know and then of course contextualize it to how i use those in my work in managing backlog here at sanger so first is to help us understand the importance of backlogs in agile projects learn how to effectively build and manage backlogs um, the key principles in agile and scrum and as well practical tips for backlog management so first we I want to assume we are all familiar with the Agile mindset, but if you're not, um, there are 12 principles and of course there are some value um, statement or core Agile values that I have outlined here. But three of them particularly stands out when it comes to effectively managing backlog, whether it's a product backlog or a project backlog in general. One, one of the first things that you want to have and make sure is up and running if you're going to build a backlog is customer collaboration. I've seen a lot of times where teams get a huge backlog that the customer knows nothing about. And then you're trying to, it's more like you're trying to shove that backlog down their throats. They do not have any input whatsoever. You have gone to your ivory tower and decided what should be on the backlog. And then you're delivering it and expecting or anticipating that you're adding values to the value to the customer. It doesn't always work that way. You want to collaborate actively and not just the theoretical collaboration. You want to put active measures in place, mechanisms that can help you have that exchange of information across the stakeholders and within the team that is delivering the software or the project. The other thing is you want to be able to respond to change. I don't know if you've heard the term, which is particular in the startup ecosystem that says you shouldn't fall in love with your prototype or your MVP. If you're building something to test or prove a concept, you don't want to fall in love with it. You don't want to get too attached to it that you are rigid and you are not responsive to change. With backlogs, you want to be open-minded to know that things can creep into the backlog, th things can become stale um, very quickly, requirements can become obsolete. You want to be able to respond to change as required. And lastly, you want to deliver working software frequently. So in Scrum, we talk about incremental delivery. At the end of every sprint, you want to have a done increment and if you do not deliver something that is working, it's as good as not even working on that thing to begin with, right? So um, if you want to build an application, you want to deliver the first baseline feature that shows value to the customer. And that way you can get things off the backlog and quickly get feedback to determine whether the things that are still on your backlog are still relevant for development. Next is looking a little bit into Scrum. For those that do not well understand Scrum, Scrum is a framework that leverages Agile and helps us to deliver incrementally 
over a period of time it's quite iterative and encourages transparency inspection and adaption of what you're working on to provide what we call a done increment a done increment is a useful piece or part of the whole of your software that you're building so in scrum you have roles like the product owner who more or less owns the backlog and grooms it the scrum master who more or less instills the scrum best practices in the team and helps the team to be more effective and you lastly you have the development team which is everyone involved in building the software so it's a cross-functional team that encompasses being front-end developer back-end devops whatever it is whatever skill is required to get the product working or effectively built um, is categorized as part of the development team and so with Scrum, there are things called artifacts, which is where the product backlog falls into. The product backlog is where you have the requirements for the product items that need to be done or checked off for that product's goal to be achieved. Uh, you have the sprint backlog, which is like a subset of the product backlog, and that is taken in every two week cycle or four week cycle. And then the increment, of course, like I mentioned, is what you want to have at the end of every sprint, something valuable, something the users can use or that adds value to both the business and to the users. There are also events. I'm deliberate about going through this because then it will form the baseline for the recommendations, suggestions and the best practices for managing your backlogs adequately. And so the last thing I'll be talking about on Scrum is the event. You have the planning where you plan what should happen in the sprint. Um, you have the daily Scrum where you meet to just share progress and talk about your blockers, things that are not allowing you to progress with the, the development work towards achieving the sprint goal. Um, you also have the sprint review where you come to speak to your stakeholders to inspect and adapt, which is review what you've done. Again, many people mistake this to be the demo session where you go and do a nice shiny slides and show to your stakeholders or to your sponsors to say, oh, we've done this bit and then we'll do the next. But you want to be able to use and maximize that time to align on goals and vision, right? To inspect on the journey so far, to inspect on the sprint so far. And then if there's a chance to pivot at any time that is what you want to find out quickly of course that does not absolve the product owner from interacting with the stakeholders within the sprint to sort of give and receive information and feedback but this is the place where you consolidate on the progress of the development life cycle towards achieving the product goal and then lastly you have the retrospective where you think about how you've worked and what improvements you could make to add efficacy to the team's way of working, um, the Scrum team's way of working. Now, why is this all relevant? We also need to understand what the product backlog is. Um, I've, I've had scenarios. I mean, I, I, I currently am battling some part of this. So everything I'm saying today is not just theories. I'm going to tell you exactly how I'm facing them and uh, what I'm doing to help improve this. A product backlog or a backlog in general is a prioritized list of features, enhancements, fixes for the product. So you have features, things that are components of the product. You have enhancements, improvements, requirements for the product and fixes like bugs, um, usability fix and all that that are then put together in a prioritized order on the backlog but to take it a bit further your backlog contains what they call product backlog items and these are just examples of some of the product backlog items sometimes they are refined that you know exactly what you need to do some other times they are not refined you do not know exactly what you need to do and you would agree with me that scrum works best in a complex complicated kind of environment where you do not necessarily know upfront all that is involved in that project or in that product but you have a fair idea of where to start and so you have those things put into your backlog and then you carry on refining and retuning and finding out if things become obsolete or not um, just to keep the backlog manageable 
Now, some of the characteristics of a product backlog is that one, it is very dynamic and evolving with the product and market needs. Like I said, you don't need to know upfront exactly what you're trying to do, right? Um, I mean, that would take you towards waterfall in a sense where every I, every T is dotted and crossed respectively. You're checking all the boxes before you launch. Not to say that waterfall is a bad methodology, I mean, for critical systems, like if you're launching into space, you don't want to find out that you don't have your 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 shuttles or whatever else mid air. You know <laughs> that would be critical. So with those kinds of um, scenarios, you want to use waterfall to make sure that things are well checked. Um, but in a fast changing environment like we are, you want to be able to be dynamic, which conforms strongly with agile and you evolve as the market and the, in this case, your market is scientific operations or whoever the scientific team you're working for or building a product for or running a project for, whatever their needs become would influence how your product backlog looks. Um, next on that is that it comprises of both big unrefined items as well as small, very refined items. So ideally, you want to prioritize it such that the small refined items come first. Uh, there are lots that go into prioritization metrics, but this is one of the easy peasy lemon squeezy criteria that you want to adopt in sort of getting your priority right. Um, and then, of course, it needs to be ordered by value and priority. Value is a it's almost like an arbitrary time right it's what what does value mean to you is it value for the pro for the for the program or is it value for the for the development team or value for sangar so you have to put all of those into considerations when prioritizing to say okay what does value mean to us and how do we then allocate the right amount of priority to these items based on that definition then that which is why you cannot just take things from another system hook line and sinker and apply to yours you have to understand the context within which you're working and how this would work best for you uh, following that is that it's a superset of the sprint backlog so if you're running sprints if you're running proper scrum emphasis on the word proper um, the product backlog is a superset of your sprint so your sprint is taking chunks and chunks out of your product backlog every two weeks out four weeks cycle depending on how the team works and now how do you build the product backlog these are just a few pointers there are many other areas that you could consider when building a product backlog you want to gather all of the initial requirements and ideas and you want to put them together you want to break them down into user stories or hypothesis i personally try to enforce that in my team such that user stories come from users, hence the name user stories. The, the, the users outline the requirement um, and then we validate, of course, we ask questions, maybe ask why five times without making them feel stupid, of course. Um, but then you ask and validate and make sure that <clears throat> the problem that they're outlining is actually a problem. And if there's value in actually addressing a problem, some of them are functional, some are non-functional requirements, so you need to be able to make the disparity between both. But then on the flip side, there are times when you as a development team identify gaps in the product and you know it is a critical gap that would enhance the usefulness of that product. And so I like to put it as hypothesis because all you have, I say this a lot as a product manager, all you have are assumptions, right? Um, if you're going to be doing evidence-based management, if there is no empirical evidence, that this is a requirement, it is an assumption, right? It's an opinion. You need evidence to back it up. So we put it as hypothesis. So you, you want to frame it like, um, so a typical example would be as a user, so you put the user persona, of course, whether as a scientific PI or whatever it is, I want to be able to do X, Y, Z so that I will get A, B, C right you being the the product manager or product owner or the development team identifying that same need wouldn't say it that way because you would then say as a product manager i want the users to be able to know you want to put it as we believe that 
then you put the value I, I think i have a template i can show you you put the value that the users would get from that hypothesis so we believe that the users will be able to do abc if they are enabled to do xyz and that is an assumption and because you framed it that way it makes it easier for you to have an open conversation to say okay does this actually make sense let me see how you interact with the pro um, with this problem that i've identified and then you validate and you don't want to have a confirmation bias so this goes into your product backlog to elicit what that particular requirement is right because you've broken it down into user stories or hypothesis and then lastly you put an acceptance criteria um, to say okay this is when we know that this feature has been resolved so there's something we call output versus outcome output is mostly numerical things you've turned out um, outcome is mostly unquantifiable it is the satisfaction you get from a particular feature right so the acceptance criteria should be focused on outcome what is the satisfaction if you understand your value proposition canvas or the empathy map there are things called pain for the users and pain relievers from the business so if you've identified a particular pain i can't get from a to z you are providing a pain reliever that helps them get from a to z right and your acceptance criteria should then say when have they got into z because then you wouldn't have a scope on your story so you fall in the pitfall of having an ill-defined story or requirement that never gets done right so this would then feed into what is your definition of done all of that has to be considered when you're adding items to your product backlog maybe not at the start but when you start refining them you need to be able to put clear user stories clear hypothesis clear acceptance criteria so we are all aligned and we know when things are done and we move on to the next bit all right so best practices um again this is not an exhaustive list but i think these are the beginning points where you need to start incorporating your stakeholders as early as possible and as often as possible which is why scrum is good you have that two weekly circle even if you want to run off into your silo you can't hide away for more than two weeks or i mean you could hide away hypothetically for four weeks right but generally scrum is adopted in two week cycle at the end of two weeks you would have to inter interpret what you've done in that two week sprint to your stakeholders and you get feedback as much as you can into the product backlog. One of the core values of Scrum is transparency. You want to be able to come to a point where a stakeholder can look into your product backlog and it makes sense to them. And so this thing I've just said would chip off a lot of things down the line. But then let me move on. So I'm just conscious of time. Please let me know how much time I have left <laughs> so I can run through. You've got time, Joshua, don't worry. Keep, keep going, take, <laughs> take all the time you need. <laughs> okay um all right so yeah again i'm just trying to set the baseline so we can then have a heart to heart question and answer session hopefully but i need to sort of touch on these key areas the other thing is you want to be able to focus on the user value and business impact because then you quickly get your backlog clogged up by nice to haves um improvement things that are coming not necessarily even from the users could be from the development team you i don't know how many of you are product owners here that run a development team and you see your developers just chucking in issues like this is a bug the users would like this and you know you want to focus on the user if you are being user-centric it shouldn't just be um hypothetical up in the air but it should be an actual thing you put at the forefront of how your backlog is structured then also business impact what does this feature mean for our business you know you start looking at how much effort is required how much FTE will be required what's the return on investment and all that and then lastly you want to keep your user story small and actionable there are times when you have big items they are fine but when you're about to work on them you want to break them down into easily deliverable chunks um, and hence you do a lot of backlog refinement right i talked about prioritizing the backlog these are just a few options that you can take personally i use the moscow which is the must have should have could have won't have 
um, but then that is not exhaustive all by itself or in isolation. You want to com- you want to combine this with other many other metrics like how much time you've got, how much budget you've got, how much capacity you've got in prioritizing stuff. And especially if you have multiple stakeholders or multiple groups that you're working for, you need to be able to have that open conversation to indicate where the product is leading and what the priorities are and make sure everybody is on board because that is very key. Communication is very key. So that is Moscow. It just helps you to prioritize on a four band category. Must have uh, absolute priority, should have come next to it. Then could have is stored on the line and wouldn't have is just something people have thought about. And the funny thing is you could have something that starts as a must have, you need to bear this in mind and ends up as a wouldn't have, which is why you should be able to respond to change very rapidly and not be attached to a particular requirement, right? Um, then you have the Canon model, which is more, is similar to the value effort matrix, but this is more customer focused, looking at how you can delight the customer. Satisfaction of the customer is pi- primary in the Canon model. So if you have between, again, I'm trying not to put on a lot of product management terms here, but this is the last one i think there is this tripartite relationship between desirability viability and feasibility right if you have a product so the first question is desirability how desirable is it would people actually want to use it viability is how valuable is it to both the people and the business how much return on investment can you get from deploying that product the technical feasibility is, can we actually achieve this, right? Your product sitting at the intersection of that gives you a higher chance, not the perfect chance, but a higher chance of achieving product market fit. Because there are people who have two elements. Without the third, you're likely to struggle a lot. If you've got desirability you just and feasibility, you build a product that everybody is so happy to use, but not willing to pay for right because it's not as viable enough for them to want to spend their money on it and if you've got viability and feasibility everybody's happy to pay for it and you can build it and they are happy but they are not happy to use it if someone else comes with the same product but good user experience off you go right i mean there are many examples out there of product that you probably started using and a better version came and you jumped ship so um in this kind of model, they, there's a huge emphasis on making sure that items on your product backlog are prioritized based on the desirability for the users. How satisfied would they feel? And maybe a little bit of viability. How useful would it be for them? Would they be willing to pay for it based on the satisfaction? But not so much on technical feasibility. Whereas, do you want to... Say something, Sarah. Yeah, yes. Sarah, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Quick question. Um, how do you measure that? So are you are you setting up so you have, for example, you, do you use Google Spreadsheet for that with all the names and then you you rate it with numbers or is it a rack you use or how do you do that? Yes. So what I do, <laughs> I've done a lot of things. <laughs> what I do <laughs> is I... I have a confluence page where I, and I will get into that later on in the slide, I guess, uh, talking about confluence page, I sort of based on, I mean, you could look at importance, urgency, um, constraints, effort, and you work it out to say, okay, this is how much is required for this particular feature. And it's then a must have and use that ranking to translate it into your backlog. So I have this spreadsheet where I just have the must code there. And then you, of course, people tell you, oh, this is must have, must have, must have, must have. But when we start refining, it's where you get the actual meat of the matter. So you, you engage all the multiple stakeholders that are involved. In my scenario now, after having that MMM and, and some Cs and maybe some S, I speak to my boss who is the team the team lead for the PAM informatics team and get some feed in from some of the faculties that are involved with these features to know when the deadline is for them. So because 
we can use timelines to also influence how those M's are then ordered. Then speak to my boss to see capacity wise, how much capacity do we have to be able to deliver on this? You see, he has a more holistic view of what other projects are likely to come in uh, or are likely to shrink or increase our capacity. If we're going to hire new persons, he has better information on that. And then based on that, I can then make some informed decision on what the priority would be. Right. So it starts off from having, you can have a spreadsheet, but it would be a danger zone to try and calculate it, to, to put an actual figure to it because you are dealing with people. Remember how I started off? that you need to be able to collaborate because i see a lot of people who try to put a metric a number on it to then say well if it is five then five it is if this is three then five comes before three there are times when three comes before five because things are changing right and one of the attributes you need to have is to be flexible enough to respond to that change because otherwise you would be attached i don't i personally do not prefer the number system because if you have a five in terms of priority and then there is a three you're automatically attached to that order to say five comes before three but you don't want to get to that point you want to be flexible enough to see the signs and realize some of those um, nuances that would influence what the order should be so it's an ongoing process but again to your answer to respond to you yes i start with that um using the moscow but then a lot of conversation informs how it's then ordered on the backlog. How long, how much time do you spend on that? Because I mean, the Moscow is the standard one that everyone uses, right? And when you then go to the next step and you refine it using Kano model, I mean, it sounds like this could take a lot of time, just talking to each individual stakeholder again, figuring out their delight level. And then you might have conflicting delight levels with key stakeholders that you then need to figure out. So how much time do you actually spend on something I did? So first thing I should have mentioned clearly is that I don't do all three. These mm -hmm. are just options. I only do one. Well, this could be somewhat intuitive as you're having this conversation, you're evaluating what's the value versus efforts in this. But this is the one I do. And I'm not recommending that you do all three in certainly not in a sequential order or in a concrete format. It could be just intuitively based on converse, conversation. You estimate what the value, what the effort required, what the capacity is from the conversation. So then to answer your question, I, it would be hard for me to quantify the time because it's become a part of the process. It's almost like it's the pipe of the pipeline, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, those conversation needs to keep happening ever, ever so frequently using the scrum ceremonies like I outlined as part of your conversation. But outside of that, you want to create a rapport with your stakeholders that you can bump into them in the diner and just ask about something spontaneously. And they are so open to respond to you, not knowing that you've just interviewed them for two minutes. And you go back to your backlog to say, now you are armed with a better information, a better view. Because someone could tell you something is an M, like I started out by saying, last two weeks, and you see them this week, and they're like, oh yeah, that conference got postponed, so it's no longer urgent, it's not a hard deadline. And that would then inform the order of your back. Did you see all of this yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, so it's just making sure you are putting at the forefront of your day-to-day -day activity, um, and you seize every little opportunity you can get. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, so I was just going to say on the value effort metrics, it's similar to the kind of model, but you're looking more on value. It's quite self-explanatory. You use like a metric system. If it's low value, low effort, you don't want to consider. If it's high effort, low value, definitely don't want to do that. If it's high value, low effort, yes, do that. If it's high value, high effort, maybe you want to do that. But this is just another thing. Then as a disclaimer, <laughs> there is no perfect method, right? It's, it could be a combination of all. It could be a mismatching of a few. But what you want to put at the forefront is the customer impact. How does this impact them both pos positively or negatively? What is the business value in that ordered prioritized backlog? And what are the technical dependencies? Because this can hugely influence how things are ordered. It could be very urgent, it could be very... I tell you what, there was a time we needed to productionize one of our softwares 
but then we had a technical dependency on ISG. So no matter how high priority it was at the time, we just couldn't do anything. It was out of our hands. So you need to be able to consider all of these moving parts while you are making the most of your prioritization metrics, right? Great. Managing the backlog. There are two key things around this, continuous refinement and collaboration. Under continuous refinement, you want to have regular backlog grooming sessions. This could be done by yourself being the product manager, trimming, tuning the acceptance criteria based on what you've heard, what you've understood, because the, the further down the line you go, the better, the clearer you understand what is required, um, you can make better decisions. Um, you can trim off things that are no longer required because they become obsolete or they are stale. Then, of course, the user stories keeps changing. Sometimes they stay the same. Most times they do not. So your acceptance criteria and all that will change as well to reflect the new definition of done. On the flip side, you want to have a collaborative re refinement session with your software developers or at least one of them. Um, there's this book called Continuous Delivery Habits by Teresa Torres. One key thing is the product trial. You have the product manager or the product owner. You have the, the software development lead and you have the designer. So ideally, that's the minimum you should have when you're doing a product um, backlog refinement session so that you can get the technical input, you can get the user experience, customer experience input. And then of course, you being the stakeholder um, proxy or somebody that understands the user and understands the vision for the product, and understands the goal for the product, you're able to provide that overarching insight. So you involve the team in the backlog refinement, the whole team, if you can, if you can't, a section of the team that is well knowledgeable to help you with that refinement then use feedback. So from your reviews, from your normal interaction, you can ask them deliberately. When you are doing the refinement, you'd have questions. That has happened to me a lot of the times. You come up with more questions than answers. And so you take those questions to the stakeholders and get feedback to say, okay, we were thinking when you said this about this um, requirement, this was how we understood it. But when we talked about it, we figured this could be a better way to approach it. What was your thought? And then you just get them talking. And then you may even realize that what they've said, what you've said are no longer valid. There's a new path forward, right? Most times I can't count how many times I go into the Slack channel, um, Slack DMs or some of my stakeholders and just give them like two options. So we and the team have talked about this and this. We are thinking of doing this. These are the risks involved. We're thinking of doing this other option. These are the risks involved. Which one would you rather pick? And you send it to them to them separately so that there is no influence um, of decision making. And so whatever they've said, most times you get them come in consensus on one, sometimes not so much. But then that gives them the chance to provide feedback and that would affect how your backlog is managed. Now, some of the challenges that are very common is Keeping the backlog manageable, I've mentioned how you can do that, but putting it at the back of your mind that regular grooming sessions is very key by yourself, with the team, and getting stakeholder input. Ensuring stakeholders are aligned is very hard, which is why you need to be transparent as much as you can. In the sprint reviews, you want to be able to tell them, okay, this is how much we want to do. And whenever you have the chance to catch up with them, okay, this is the roadmap of what we're trying to do. Is this still valid or not? Um, and then lastly, balancing technical debt and new features. Again, making the improvement iterative, grooming and rechecking and evaluating and inspecting would help you catch anything that is going to encroach on the health of your backlog. I think, yes, this is the last slide. Final thoughts. Continuous improvement is key, like I've mentioned. Um, collaboration and communication ensures success. You can all agree, but most times this is vague, but you need to be able to put little, little mechanisms in place, leveraging Scrum, leveraging some of these opportunities you get to speak to your stakeholders can improve the collaboration and communication, not necessarily sending emails every now and then, 
but you can look for more effective ways to reach your collaborators um very key you may get it wrong many times but then i put you will get it wrong many times and it's okay it, it's okay it, as long as you're doing it in an iterative um fashion you're going back to drawing board and making sure things are put in the right place and the right order it's fine but just have that open mind to say oh yeah i i am i was wrong to have prioritized it's happened to me before i mean i was wrong to have prioritized a particular story over the other and i pushed the whole development behind by two weeks because one had gone into the, the sprint the other did not make it there and it so happens that the other was of more priority than that one but there were some missing bits of information i did not have whereas which is why you need to be able to be responsive um lesson learned sometimes you compromise to avoid cataloging yes there's that itching to oh this is a new cool feature let's just add it to the backlog before you know your backlog is stemming up to 500 items 400 items right and that's terrible it makes important stories get missing it's makes the team lack focus you just have too much to manage and so you want to be able to compromise on how do you make sure that only important features and importance needs to be de um, defined by you and the collaborators or whoever you're working with get on the backlog if they don't get on the backlog and need to be somewhere do they do they need to be on the backlog where can they stay i created a buffer system where new upcoming project or whatever it is goes onto a confluence page first and has to be validated there and everything will be done once we know we can then deliver on it in a couple of months six months one year it moves to the backlog and then we can start looking into that many a times you put those things on a confluence page and they die out right so if they were important enough you will get them onto the backlog eventually so that just one that's just one way of keeping your backlog slim the other way is continually pruning items that are getting stale if they have been there nobody's touched it for some months i mean that's an indication if it's been there for a year and nobody's done anything that's an indication that it should go away <laughs> you know just let it go and and reduce how much you're cataloging on your backlog then lastly leverage means of keeping the backlog very lean like jira sprint some people create two sprints right you have the backlog on jira if you're very conversant you can create a sprint that is not started that is not active and you can plan ahead to say okay i'm scheduling this sprint um so it's another way of managing one thing i did for my team is there were some technical stories that were added which are well important but not coming from the users and they are like bugs fixes improvement opportunities i i created another sprint that are called technical bits and every of those stories, I move them there. The backlog, I want it to be in a state whereby I can show it to one of the stakeholders and they immediately understand what is happening. But with the technical bit, you have KHS, whatever, this, that, 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 Cypress. They don't know all that, not necessarily. And it gets them off balance. Like it's a lot of information. It's not clear. It's not transparent enough. So just to make sure the backlog is clean and neat enough for the users to understand, I sort of ab um, abstracted it into a particular sprint called technical bits. And um, yeah, so you can leverage Confluence, like I mentioned, as an initial buffer point. Um, you can use other projects. I created another project where I just move things that are getting stale or are nice to have to that project. And eventually some of them will die, some wouldn't. And there's this cool feature on Jira as well called advanced plan you can see on a high level where things are and then you can trim and and refine them as needed so yes that went longer than i anticipated but i hope you you got some some things from what i've said that's fantastic. fantastic thank you yeah, yeah. sorry joe jump straight over the top of you yeah brilliant. no no go for it that's brilliant exactly what thanks I was gonna say. <laughs> That was brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Joshua. 